Hi there, this is Dave Humpes and a welcome to this very special teleclinic on H. pylori treatment in 2013. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is just say a, a huge welcome and also a very big thank you for taking the time to be here either live with us on the clinic or listening to the recording um, of this particular session. Uh, I truly appreciate the commitment that you've made to be here. Um, you know, you could have been elsewhere doing something else, but you've chosen to be here and listen uh, and watch this presentation. So I'm going to do my very best to add as much value during the time we have as I possibly can. The aims of today's teleclinic um, are well, several fold really. I'd like to try and explain the current issues in medical and natural H. pylori treatment as they stand now in 2013. I'd like to assess the main advantages and disadvantages of each uh, treatment method. I'd like to teach you uh, how I actually got rid of H. pylori, not just once, but uh, actually twice. Um, I had H. pylori twice, uh, believe it or not, and I managed to get rid of it without too many problems both times. I'd like to explain why eradicating H. pylori might not improve symptoms. This is a really common thing that people uh, get confused about. Uh, I'd also like to explain why a lot of people really need to change their diets in order to overcome the symptoms. Um, even when H. pylori is gone, sometimes foods that people are eating are uh, exacerbating or perpetuating the same symptoms as H. pylori can cause. And I'd like to also help describe how you can heal your stomach once the H. pylori bacteria have been eradicated. Now, um, as many of you know who are on uh, our email list, we have, a, we have a heck of a lot of people on our email lists on our database. And um, at the time that I uh, finished off this presentation, we'd had more than 250 questions submitted. Uh, it's actually uh, over 300 uh, questions by the time of actually um, uh, started the presentation and obviously um, I can't possibly answer all those questions on this one-off uh, call or in this session uh, but I've grouped them together into a handful of the most frequently asked ones and um, we'll be running several webinars over the over the forthcoming weeks and months to answer some of the questions I can't answer today. Um, we had some questions that came in on H. pylori symptoms, H. pylori testing, parasites, specific conditions like heartburn, irritable bowel syndrome and things like that. But this particular webinar uh, or teleclinic covers H. pylori treatment only. I'm not going to cover the other uh, questions because we just don't have time, as I say. And just to repeat, we'll be running additional events to cover questions that are not related to H. pylori treatment. So who am I? Just very quickly, um, some of you already know who I am. Some of you may have only joined our uh, um, email and database very, very recently. Well, I've been in the um, health and nutrition industry for more than 12 years now. Um, of those 12 years, six of those have been as what we call a functional medicine practitioner. And functional medicine is basically a discipline where we use some common sense and also some very, very sophisticated lab testing to find out what's in people's bodies that shouldn't be there so we can help them get rid of it and what's missing or inadequate so we can help them put it back. And when you put that equation together, you can generally uh, solve most of the common health complaints that people have relatively quickly. It's not rocket science. Uh, I've worked in uh, professional sport, including uh, with England rugby and numerous professional and international athletes, particularly soccer players. Uh, but to be honest, the majority of my work is actually in helping people overcome many of the same health challenges that I actually experienced myself and that are a lot more commonplace in society, including, of course, H. pylori, parasites, digestive problems, food allergies, and those kinds of things. Um, now, I actually had uh, H. pylori, I picked up H. pylori in 2004 while I was on holiday, as I'll explain later. Um, I managed to get rid of it, but not until around about 2007. There's a misprint on this slide because actually my H. pylori came back later. Um, than 2007 again. The first time I actually found out about it was 2007. I got rid of it, then it came back, um, and I got rid of it again. Now, the second time it came along, I also had my fiance tested. She had H. pylori, which is probably where I picked it up again. 
um, because person-to-person -person transmission is definitely a way that people can get hold of or acquire H. pylori, and her brother also had it. We all managed to get rid of it using the strategies that I'm going to teach you uh, today. Um, when I actually had my own H. pylori infection, I kind of went and read everything I could possibly find about it. I found that there was quite a lot of inadequate information, as I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and I actually released a, an e-book in 2008 um, and a paperback book in 2011 called The H. pylori Diet, uh, which explained exactly how I got rid of it. And, and from my experience, many of the steps that people need to take, not only to get rid of H. pylori, but to make sure their symptoms go away as well, which is important. Now, we've sold um, more than 10,000 PDF copies and paperback copies of that book. We've also sold plenty of the DVDs um, from a live seminar that I did in London in 2010, uh, which we filmed as well. And you can get both those products free um, uh, if you listen to um, uh, the rest of this uh, particular presentation I'll, I'll show you and teach you how you can do that later but the point of giving you those figures is not to blow my own trumpet is not to try and show off or be arrogant or anything silly like that uh, the main reason I wanted to mention those numbers is that I found it interesting that so many people need the advice or are looking for the advice because I think if medical treatment and medical knowledge about H. pylori was optimal I wouldn't be in business. I wouldn't need to write the book. I wouldn't need to help people. I wouldn't need to consult with so many people. And having consulted with literally well over a thousand people over the last five years on, on these and related issues, you know, I can tell you that there's an enormous demand for, for coaching and help in this area, which tells me that somewhere down the line, the medical system's not doing as good a job as perhaps people would like it to. So, when I was actually conducting my research, when I was phoning uh, knowledgeable doctors and naturopaths, when I was reading books, doing all those kinds of things about H. pylori uh, and its symptoms, the way to test for it and treat it, I actually found that the information on most of the mainstream medical sites was and still is dangerously incomplete. The information is not wrong. It's just incomplete and it doesn't really tell the full story about H. pylori. It kind of just says... Here are a few common symptoms that H. pylori causes. You take these antibiotics and it goes away. You know, job done. But you and I both know, I assume you know, because otherwise you probably wouldn't be watching this presentation, it's not always as simple as that. And what I'm here to do is try and balance the equation and complete the information for you so that you have more options. Now, I'm actually about to launch something called the H. pylori Home Recovery Plan, which has been a couple of years in the making, and it's going to be a 12-week uh, home recovery plan, as it says, delivered live and online, a little bit like this webinar, this teleclinic is being uh, delivered, full of um, uh, direct support with me and my staff for a, a relatively small number of people. More on that later, but if you are struggling with H. pylori, if you have some more complex issues, uh, this problem, may, uh, excuse me, this program might be of interest to you. Now, just before we proceed into the to the real meat of this teleclinic, I want to just point out that the presentation isn't intended as medical advice and it's not here to replace a one-to-one -one relationship with your doctor or licensed healthcare provider. I'm going to provide you with a lot of background information and choices and options for you, but I'm not giving you specific advice on how to treat H. pylori. It's not actually legal for me to do that uh, in this kind of forum. Now, there's no right or wrong. You know, I, I get a lot of opinions. I'm bombarded. I look at a lot of forums and things like that on H. pylori. see a lot of people forcing their opinions on people and saying, this is the right way, that's the wrong way. What I'm here to say is that there's no right or wrong way to deal with H. pylori. There's only the way that works best for you. And what works for one person may not necessarily work for everybody. I've found that out specifically through experience and a lot of experience at that. My goal is to provide information that your doctor may not share with you. It may also help you overcome some of the confusion about things that are written on internet forums and things like that so that you can make an informed choice from informed consent rather than being forced down any particular treatment path. Now, first question we're going to ask, and quite a few people actually wrote in with this question, is does H. pylori need to be treated? Well, as you probably know, H. pylori can cause a heck of a lot of symptoms. 
Uh, again, you probably wouldn't be attending this uh, session if uh, you had H. pylori and you felt amazing. You, you'd probably have no need for it. Some of the common symptoms are things like heartburn, chest and stomach pain, acid reflux, bloating, um, symptoms that are uh, similar to irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. H. pylori makes some people feel tired. It definitely causes skin disorders in some people like hives and uh, rosacea. Uh, it can disrupt the sleep because of the pain that it can cause. It can affect mood uh, and a whole manner of different um, symptoms and problems can occur around the body because of this pesky little bug. So that's one reason why people who have those symptoms obviously want to treat it. Uh, it can lead to stomach ulcers. Uh, we know this because Barry Marshall, who is the uh, Australian doctor, and his colleagues were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2005 for proving that H. pylori causes stomach ulcers. It, if left unchecked, certain strains of H. pylori appear to be able to cause a condition called atrophic gastritis, which is where the stomach lining is severely eroded, and that can cause a lot of complications because then you don't produce enough stomach acid, um, you can't digest food properly, you get things like vitamin B12 deficiency and iron deficiency, anemia, and a whole host of other nutrients become depleted and you can't function properly because of those nutritional deficiencies. Therefore, you can basically develop any and every symptom as a result of that. Now, it's an indirect result of having H. pylori for a long time. So that's another checkbox that says to me, yeah, we, we, we really need to treat this thing. H. pylori is the number one risk factor for certain stomach cancers. That's documented in the literature. And it may also play a role in Parkinson's disease, autism, and various other neurological disorders as well. Um, H. pylori does also appear to have a causative role in insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, uh, cholesterol changes in the blood, heart disease, and stroke. I have a new book coming out shortly, which is called H. pylori, From Heartburn to Heart Attacks. And it explains a lot of these kind of secret or unknown links between H. pylori and cardiovascular disease that nobody is really talking about. And yet the information is completely evidence-based. There are studies out there showing this, and it's pretty much irrefutable. Why nobody's talking about this effect of H. pylori, I don't know. But the fact of the matter is it's associated with at least 12 heart disease and um, cerebrovascular or kind of stroke um, uh, disease uh, risk factors. It's really important to know that. So again, does it need to be treated? Well, you know, I would say that it definitely does. Some people argue that H. pylori can actually have benefits, and I'm not going to refute that. H. pylori can modulate the immune system, as therefore any symptoms that are related to the immune system have the potential to go either way. So some studies suggest that H. pylori can actually have a suppressing effect on uh, uh, conditions like asthma and certain kinds of allergies as well. And what we also know is that eradicating H. pylori has also been shown to reduce the risk of esophageal cancer. I have my own theories about that. They're a little bit too complex, but I have a feeling that it may be related to uh, either lasting damage, um, uh, excuse me, either uh, damage caused by yeast and fungal overgrowth that gets into the esophagus when the H. pylori is gone, or something to do with um, a, a fault in the um, uh, what we call the lower esophageal sphincter. But I can't go into that in detail here. Maybe when we talk about symptoms and diseases of H. pylori in another session, I can actually talk about that in more detail because it's hard to explain just with a couple of sentences. Um, what about asymptomatic H. pylori? Well, research tells us that H. pylori can cause significant long-term damage even when it's not causing obvious symptoms. So this silent damage where H. pylori is kind of hanging around in the uh, stomach for a long time, people don't necessarily have the heartburn and the common symptoms, but that damage can still be um, uh, being done on a day-to-day -day basis if the H. pylori is not, is not treated. So even when it's not symptomatic, there are arguments that it needs, still needs to be treated. A lack of symptoms doesn't necessarily mean that the H. pylori should be ignored. A lot of people who are asymptomatic or who do not have symptoms may also pass H. pylori inadvertently. Nobody wants to give people other people H. pylori or anything else for that matter on purpose. Um, but, you know, 
you can carry it around. You don't really feel any effects. You have uh, sex with someone, you kiss someone, you share eating and drinking utensils with someone, and boom, they pick up H. pylori. Now, all of a sudden, they feel lousy because they have it. You passed it on even though you didn't have symptoms. So again, it's another reason, even if you get diagnosed, I still think it's responsible for you to seek a treatment method to get rid of it so that you don't affect other people. And let's not forget that I'm pretty sure this is what happened to me the second time around when I believe that my fiance passed her H. pylori infection onto me. She did not have symptoms, I did, okay? And that's very important to understand, I think. So does it need to be treated? Well, as I said maybe five minutes ago, it's your choice. It's not for me to force my opinion on you, but my opinion is that the risks of carrying H. pylori around far outweigh the benefits. And when it's detected, I personally believe it should be dealt with. Um, after all, when we break it down, it is the number one risk factor for stomach cancer. You know, you're not going to uh, breathe in asbestos knowing that it's you know, in the same classification for lung cancer, uh, i.e. a class 1 carcinogen, as H. pylori is for stomach cancer, you know, you'd stop, you'd stop breathing it, you'd, you'd, you'd immediately get away from the asbestos if you knew about that. So you've got to look at it from that kind of perspective, and is it worth the risk of leaving it there, even if you don't have the symptoms? So that's a question for you to answer in your own mind. Now, let's say you decide, yeah, my gosh, I definitely do want to treat it. How do we go about dealing with it? Well, as many of you will know, medical treatment usually begins with a therapy called triple therapy, which is a combination of two different types of antibiotic with an antacid or acid blocking drug, which is usually something called a proton pump inhibitor. Brand names of proton pump inhibitors include uh, Nexium, uh, Prilosec, the generic names for the, dr for the actual molecules that they use in those drugs, the active ingredients are things like Omeprazole, pantoprazole, lanzoprazole, esomeprazole, etc. They, they sort of end with a zol, if you like. That combination of drugs is usually taken for 7 to 14 days, depending on the country you're in or, or the region. And it used to be extremely effective. But particularly over sort of the last 10 or 15 years, success rates are declining significantly, um, and that has created a little bit of a problem. Now, um, what do the experts say about this? Well, the following slides on the presentation don't necessarily comprise my information per se. They're taken directly from something called the Maastricht Consensus Guidelines for H. pylori treatment, which was issued in 2012 by an organization called the European Helicobacter Study Group. And the European Helicobacter Study Group publishes its own journal. There is a journal called Helicobacter. It's not all about H. pylori because there are other Helicobacter organisms. But I've read every sort of uh, uh, article in these issues stretching back a number of years. I've skim read them and I've looked at some of the really important studies and looked what they had to say and presented that in, you know, in a lot of the articles and, and information that I present. And the information that, was, that came out in 2012 was basically as follows. The triple treatment, including proton pump inhibitor, clarithromycin, which is a type of antibiotic, and amoxicillin or metronidazole, which are two more types of antibiotics, proposed at the first Maastricht con conference to treat H. pylori infection has become universal since it was recommended by all the consensus conferences held around the world. All that says in layman's terms is everybody knows to use triple therapy. That's it. Triple therapy success rates. The problem is that most recent data show that this combination has lost some efficacy and often allows a cure of only a maximum of 70% of the patients, which is less than the 80% rate aimed for at the beginning and far below what should be expected for an infectious disease. So essentially, again, what they're saying now is that triple therapy is no longer acceptable as a form of treatment, yet it remains the first line of treatment prescribed by most doctors. So you, can you see where there's a problem here? I've personally read studies where eradication rates were as low as 55%, so it's almost a 50-50 gamble. That's not every study. Some studies are still looking pretty good, 80% success rates or more, for example. But 
if you're in a certain region and they have a certain type of H. pylori strain that is resistant to one of the drugs that they're using, the success rate is going to drop right down to the point where you're almost basing your health on the toss of a coin. And I don't think that's a good thing, particularly when antibiotics can cause a ton of side effects that can make you feel lousy, uh, etc., in addition to the fact that they may not work particularly well. Now, antibiotic resistance is the single most important factor for the declining eradication rates. Basically, what happens is the H. pylori bugs drink up the drugs and they basically stick two fingers up and say, you know, you've been chucking these drugs in at us for, for years or even a decade and a half or whatever it might be. Uh, and we're, we're just, you know, we're immune to it now. The, the drugs are just not doing anything. So, you know, we're going nowhere. Now, the resistance rates vary in different geographic areas and the selection of the treatment needs to be adjusted according to the local resistance patterns. So if you have an area where these H. pylori bugs are resistant to the drug clarithromycin, it makes sense not to use it. If they're resistant to metronidazole, it makes sense not to use that one because you're going to up the treatment rates. The problem is virtually no frontline sort of GP clinic or uh, gastro specialist clinic that I know of in the UK that my colleagues talk to me about in the US and Australia and Europe are actually doing resistance testing to find out what strains of H. pylori people have. So it's really just a shot in the dark. Here's your triple therapy, let's see if it works, and that's it. And it does work for some people, but it doesn't work for other people, as we've just seen. Now, the specific antibiotics that tend to be used in H. pylori treatment, and, and this is important for the, for the following slides, are clarithromycin, amoxicillin, metronidazole, tetracycline, tenidazole, rifabutin, levofloxacin, and moxifloxacin. You don't really need to remember the words, just a few of them we're going to discuss briefly here. Clarithromycin resistance. The long-term use of clarithromycin, mainly for respiratory tract infections, has led to high H. pylori clarithromycin resistance. In Japan, for example, a four-fold increase of clarithromycin resistance occurred between 1993 and 2000. Continued. Globally, clarithromycin resistance sits at around about 17.2%. In Europe, the average resistance rate is 11.1%, but this varies from country to country. So, for example, in Spain, the resistance rate is close to 50%, whereas in Sweden, it's down at 1.5%. In Asia, the average is 18.9% resistance, which varies greatly again because in Malaysia, the resistance rate might be as low as 2.1%, but in Japan it's at 40%. And then in America, our friends over uh, stateside, you're looking at a resistance rate of 29.3%, which is you know really, really high. And you can read the article from which that information is taken um, at the link I've provided below. Again, it's not me guessing, it's information that's come from medical sources. What about metronidazole and um, amoxicillin and levofloxacin, uh, which are three of the other drugs used? Well, the resistance of H. pylori to metronidazole has been reported in most of the studies to be between 30 and 40 percent. A high resistance of metronidazole has been reported for Australia due to high use there. The worldwide levofloxacin resistance rate is 16.2 percent. In Taiwan, a five-fold increase in resistance was observed before and after the year 2004. Fortunately, and some good news at last, it's definitely not all doom and gloom, the resistance against amoxicillin is virtually zero, with few exceptions. So it looks like amoxicillin is something that is, is worth using for doctors who are prescribing this triple therapy. Um, several attempts have been made to overcome treatment failure, and newer regimens have been introduced, including sequential, quadruple therapies, and various combinations of new and old antibiotics. So let's just have a look at the different um, strategies that are available using these combinations. As we've just discussed, triple therapy has been established as the first line or frontline therapy over the past years around the world. And it's usually a proton pump inhibitor which blocks the acid production. And that, and that does two things by the way. The acid reduction 
helps the digestive lining to heal. So if the acid is irritating the stomach lining because of H. pylori, for example, um, blocking the acid uh, can, can relieve the symptoms while the antibiotics kill the H. pylori. It also happens that the antibiotics work better in a less acidic environment. So you get a double whammy from taking the antacids. There are problems with the antacids, which I'm not going to talk about here. That will that will come in a different webinar. Uh, but there are major, major problems with using the antacids, particularly for longer than they're needed. And unfortunately, some people are on them for way, way too long, in my opinion. So they give the proton pump inhibitor with clarithromycin and amoxicillin or clarithromycin and metronidazole. They're generally the two frontline therapies. Many of you listening have, you know, may have taken that particular therapy. Second line therapy. So if the frontline therapy, triple therapy fails, um, usually what they'll do is they'll either add a compound called bismuth in another pill, which is actually a naturally occurring element, um, and they'll add it to the triple therapy to make what we call quadruple therapy, or they'll use something called sequential therapy, which is another option where the drugs are given in uh, in a in a back to back fashion rather than being taken at the same time so you'll take an antibiotic with the acid blocker and then once that antibiotic's finished you'll take another antibiotic with that acid blocker and that has shown some promise but again still the the um, elimination rates of h pylori are still probably not high enough using that strategy then uh, some doctors may also use levofloxacin which is another antibiotic um triple therapy um, because it tends to be more effective in some areas than the standard clarithromycin-based um, triple therapies. If it sounds complex, take a look on the action guide that you can download from beneath this webinar window if you're watching it at my website, um, because uh, it will give you a summary of these uh, therapies on, on one of the pages that's really easy to, to break down and understand. The action guide is just there to help you pull the information into a simplified form. In terms of second line therapy, treatment of H. pylori infection is facing a challenge because of increasing treatment failure with current treatment regi regimens. Several new treatment strategies with the intention to overcome antibiotic resistance have been introduced. Quadruple therapies are emerging as first line alternatives in areas of high clarithromycin resistance. So what they're saying is when they know that, that the area has high clarithromycin resistance, they probably won't use it anymore, uh, or they'll use uh, a quadruple therapy, which tends to be a little bit more potent. But it involves taking more pills, and it's not as easy to necessarily complete the, the course. Now, rescue therapy is a term used um, to explain treatment that tends to be given when at least two previous attempts have failed. So after tr two treatment failures, it appears recommendable to empirically prescribe antibiotics not previously used, so want to use different antibiotics, but whenever possible to obtain a gastric biopsy specimen to culture H. pylori and perform susceptibility testing. What that means is you take a bunch of H. pylori bugs from someone's gut by snipping out a tiny piece of stomach tissue, you culture them, grow them, and then you see which drugs kill them. That way, you're not playing guessing games anymore. You can give the right drug to the right person based on the specific type of H. pylori they have. Now, my, I mean, that's a perfect, it's a utopia. It's a perfect way to do things. The problem is this. Hardly anybody's doing it in the real world. This is very, very utopian thinking here. And because of the vast numbers of people that have to be dealt with with the medical systems around the world, this kind of therapy is rarely done, except in very um, uh, infrequent circumstances. Rescue therapy continued. After the failure of second-line therapies, rescue therapy should be guided by antimicrobial resistance testing whenever possible, as recommended in the current European guidelines. Again, all that's saying is basically, will this drug kill the H. pylori that person X has? Good. Will it kill the H. pylori that person Y has? No. Okay, good. What about this drug? No, that one won't work either. What about this one? Yes. Okay, so we can start to tailor, or the doctors can start to tailor, customise the treatment to the patient. 
And that could be available in your area. So if you've had lots of difficulty getting rid of H. pylori and you're really struggling and you still want to use the antibiotics, take that kind of information to your doctor if they're not forthcoming with it. Okay, so again, just to mention the action guide, which is available beneath the, um, uh, the video window here, the presentation window. And to quickly summarize, uh, look at the action guide, the details are there. But your basic options are uh, various kinds of triple therapy. Then if that doesn't work, you either use a different triple therapy with drugs that you haven't used before, or you move on to quadruple therapy or sequential therapy, um, or you use the levofloxacin-based triple therapy. So that might be confusing, but I think if you read the page on the action guide, it becomes nice and clear. And um, if you discuss with your doctor, if you are struggling, then your doctor should be able to guide you on which option is going to be best for you. Okay, there's another broader reason why my personal opinion is that antibiotic use is um, not necessarily the best option. And uh, I found um, a fairly disturbing article on the BBC News website. The BBC is obviously, if you're not familiar with the BBC, I'm sure most of you are, it's a very, very large news network here in the UK. It's a global news network. And the uh, chief medical officer for England said, the rise in drug-resistant infections is comparable to the threat of global warming, according to chief medical officer for England. Now, whether or not you think global warming is a, is a threat, we're just talking about the comparison here. Let, let's not get into a debate about whether global warming is real or not. Professor Dame Sally Davis said bacteria were becoming resistant to current drugs and there were few antibiotics to replace them. The link for the article is on this slide if you want to take a look yourself. It is clear that we might not ever see global warming. The apocalyptic scenario is that when I need a new hip in 20 years, I'll die from a routine infection because we've run out of antibiotics. It's very serious and it's very serious because we're not using our antibiotics effectively. Okay, Chief Medical Officer for England who said that. Not, not Dave Hompez spouting off some anti um, or some, some, you know, trying to bash antibiotics. This is not coming from me. I'm just quoting what this lady said. Um, Professor Hugh Pennington from the University of Aberdeen added, we have to be aware that we aren't going to, uh, excuse me, we are going, we have to be aware that we aren't going to have new wonder drugs coming along because there aren't any. So what he's saying is that they're not finding new antibiotics. We have to just use combinations of the same ones and that may cause problems further down the line. Uh, again, going back to the Maastricht consensus from 2012, I've highlighted in red here this sentence, while no new drug has been developed for this indication, meaning H. pylori infection, a number of studies have been carried out in recent years using different combinations of known antibiotics. Again, just um, uh, uh, re-emphasizing there that there aren't any new drugs being made. This is a myth within the pharmaceutical um, world or the, or the message that they like to give out to people is that they're pioneers finding all these new drugs all the time. But for a lot of the common complaints that people have, uh, because the drugs have already been overused, particularly the antibiotics, they're just not working as well anymore. And there aren't any new ones to replace the existing ones. Okay. In terms of the World Health Organization, the WHO has warned the world is heading for a post-antibiotic era unless action is taken. It paints a future in which many common infections will no longer have a cure and, once again, kill unabated. So talking about some of the old world infections that don't really cause many problems now may come back if these organisms, these bacteria, continue to develop resistance to the antibiotics. And the more we use the antibiotics, particularly for things that don't necessarily need antibiotics to be dealt with properly, the more we run the risk individually and as a society and a population of uh, succumbing to this major problem of antibiotic resistance. So I want you to ask yourself, do you want to risk future problems in your own life by using antibiotics to treat something that does not actually require pharmaceutical antibiotics? I don't know about you, but if I get a life-threatening infection in five or ten years' time, I want to be able to bosh down some antibiotics that the doctor gives me and save my life. 
I don't want to be in a situation where I have a life-threatening infection and they can't give me an antibiotic that works because all the bad bugs have become resistant because everybody around society, you know, in the population has been using antibiotics to treat things that, that don't necessarily require uh, the use of antibiotics. So that's kind of a philosophical question, um, but it's something I think people really um, may want to uh, take a look at. You may want to have a look at that yourself and, and, and contemplate it in, you know, in your own mind. Okay, antibiotics, as many people know, can cause side effects ranging from nausea, stomach upset, diarrhea, headache, metallic taste, darkened tongue, sensitivity to the sun, depression, etc., etc. Again, that's a problem because um, when patients don't comply with the full course of antibiotics, the um, effectiveness of the treatment falls, you know, the effectiveness drops. So adherence to the therapy is associated with a much higher eradication rate, and that's obviously to be expected. Further aspects that may negatively affect treatment success that many people don't realise are a problem are increased body mass index, so when people are moving into being overweight or possibly even obese, and also smoking. Those two factors can actually reduce the efficacy of the antibiotics as well. Reinfection is a problem, especially in the developing countries. Reinfection often occurs in developing countries within the first year. H. pylori does not know international boundaries. It doesn't jump out of the aeroplane or off the boat um, you know, when you go overseas. Because of all the international travel we have, you know, it's a lot easier to pick these bad bugs up when we go to places like Central America, South America, Mexico, um, certain places in Asia, etc., etc. So people can be reinfected. We don't develop immunity to H. pylori just because we've had it once. I've seen that information on the internet. Um, as far as I can see from my own research, it's a myth. Okay, so a very quick treatment in terms of the medical, uh, excuse me, a, med a quick summary <laughs> in terms of the medical H. pylori treatments. The antibiotics do work. Let's never forget this. They work brilliantly for some people and they work quickly for some people. They're also an inexpensive option if you're in a country that has a national health service or, of course, if you're paying for insurance, you should be able to get the prescription very, very inexpensively. The problems are, contrary to what many doctors are still telling patients, these antibiotic treatments are nowhere near 100% effective. They can cause side effects. The more we use the antibiotics, the more antibiotic resistance is likely to become a problem. And importantly, something that we haven't touched on yet, the antibiotics, just taking some pills to remove H. pylori, does nothing to heal the gut lining once the H. pylori has gone. And that's really important and it's something we'll move on to shortly. It's one of the reasons why people's symptoms remain, even though the H. pylori is killed off. Okay, it's a little bit complex. H. pylori treatment is just simply not always as easy or as simple as taking a bunch of anti antibiotics and saying, hey, presto, the infection has gone. It can be simple, as I've said, for some people, but certainly not in every case, not always. Many factors affect clinical outcomes, and unfortunately, some doctors are still unaware of these idiosyncrasies. So what are the other options? Let's now take a look at some of the natural options used by alternative healthcare practitioners and by um, uh, consumers like you and me who maybe don't want to take the antibiotics for whatever reason. Um, this is going to hopefully increase your range of choices for dealing with the situation significantly. H. pylori natural treatments. I've put some images up there of specific products that I've found to be useful in my own clinical practice and my own experience over the last half decade or so. Several alternatives exist for fighting H. pylori. They do work. I'm walking proof. I beat it twice. I didn't take any antibiotics. Um, you'll see my uh, one of my before and after lab tests in a moment to, to show uh, that, that it worked for me. There is some scientific evidence behind natural therapy, but the research is actually expensive, and so the research is not extensive because nobody can really afford to, to, to do it, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit why, uh, more about why that is shortly. Just going back to my story very quickly, without going into too much depth, I went on holiday to Egypt, which is in North Africa in 2004. I developed severe vomiting, severe chest pain, and heartburn. As the week or so went by, um, uh, the symptoms gradually turned into more of a stomach ache, 
with a lot of bloating, loose stools, nausea, etc. And when I came back from Egypt um, in late 2004, I didn't quite feel the same. In fact, I never felt the same after that food poisoning incident. The severe heartburn and acid reflux and what have you came back, ironically, while I was studying to be a functional medicine practitioner with my mentor, Dr. Dan Kalish, over in the uh, States there in California. And I got these symptoms back in 2004, and I also developed a lot of anxiety. Um, my mojo left me, I, my libido disappeared, I, I was suffering with poor sleep, fatigue, all kinds of crazy symptoms. And occasionally I would vomit in the morning, and um, uh, it was actually that vomiting in the morning for no reason that, that led me to start my, uh, my inquisition, if you like, into, into what was going on. And I was pretty confused because really I was eating fairly healthily and I was a fairly fit and athletic personal trainer. You know, to look at me, you would say, well, there's nothing wrong with that guy. But inside I felt awful. And I, th I was figuring, God, if, if this, some, whatever is affecting me can affect me, imagine how other people might feel who haven't looked after themselves or who don't know what I know to look after myself. It's, this thing could be a major problem. So I ran a stool antigen test at home using a private lab, which is on the next slide. Um, but when I found out that I had H. pylori, the protocol I learned in my functional medicine training, which was using mastic gum, bismuth compound, actually made me feel worse. So rather than take antibiotics, um, you know, that mastic gum and bismuth compound had been working really well for some of my my mentor's clients. You know, he he had success with it, but it made me feel a lot worse. So I had to go and find some other solutions. Just quickly to look at my first lab test here, which was from uh, September 2007. Uh, what you can see right at the bottom, there's a, um, a red arrow there, and it says H. pylori positive. You can see that the H. pylori stool antigen was detected, showing that I had H. pylori. You also see a bunch of other markers on there. This test was not just for H. pylori. It was to detect parasites and yeast and fungal overgrowth and other bacteria and, and things like that. After taking my treatment, I'll tell you what happened. I felt so good so quickly when I started to use um, the treatment methods that, that I found that I didn't bother get, getting retested till much later. So I figured if I want to prove that I got rid of this thing, I need to run a retest, but all my symptoms had kind of gone away, or certainly my H. pylori related symptoms. So about a year later, 11th of September 2008, uh, I did another stool test with the same lab, and what you can see it's quite interesting because right at the bottom the H. pylori had gone. It was not detected. H. pylori negative, which mirrored my symptoms. But in the meantime, what had happened is I'd developed some other symptoms like loose stools, kind of just um, feeling really gassy and bloating before going to the toilet, um, and, and still not quite feeling right, you know, from an energy perspective. All my nausea, my morning vomiting, my anxiety, my chest pain, heartburn had all gone, but these other nagging little symptoms remained. And what you can see on this second test is that they found a parasite called Blastocystis hominis, which is can be a beast. It can really cause a lot of problems in people. They also found uh, a mold overgrowth called Aspergillus, which you can also see on this test. This is one of the reasons why I try to encourage as many people as I can to run a comprehensive stool test like this when they have H. pylori because in at least 50% of the people we find other things that need to be dealt with which is another reason why symptoms don't go away even when H. pylori is successfully treated. It's a gem or a nugget piece of information that I think is essential for helping people overcome all their symptoms. Now, hundreds of our clients over the last half decade or so have successfully eradicated H. pylori without antibiotics or by using a combination of the medical treatment and the natural methods. I've personally interpreted more than 1,200 uh, stool tests from uh, clients around the world. So I've seen a lot of things going on in people's digestive systems. You know, H. pylori with other bugs, H. pylori on its own, other bugs without H. pylori, etc., etc., also, things like gluten intolerance and inability to digest food because of low enzyme levels and very low good bacteria levels and, you know, the whole shebang. We've, if, if, if it's there to be seen, I've, I've seen it. I've seen people with worm infections, I've seen people with massive yeast overgrowth, um, I've seen people with huge amounts of inflammation in their digestive system because of gluten and clostridium difficile infections and on and on and on and on. 
So when we deal with all these things, we tend to see enormous improvements in symptoms, not just removing H. pylori, but dealing with the symptoms and getting the person better. It's a little bit of a different approach. Now, the scientific literature, as I said a moment ago, is lacking. It's very expensive to run clinical trials where you get a bunch of people and you say, right, these people have H. pylori, let's give them this um, herbal product, for example, or give them a bunch of these foods that have been shown to clear H. pylori, and then let's track them over a couple of months, and then let's retest them and write it all up. It costs a lot of money to do that. And really, when you look at the costs, it's only the pharmaceutical companies who have huge amounts of money who can really afford to run them. This is why you don't see enormous amounts of scientific literature regarding natural therapies for H. pylori or, or pretty much anything else for that matter. Now, the big pharma companies cannot patent a natural substance. Therefore, without being able to patent it, they're not able to make as much money from recommending it or selling it. And whilst that's a little bit borderline conspiracy theory, that's the real reason why the big pharmaceutical companies are not interested in developing natural therapies and promoting them to the mass market through the medical system. Now, if you want to read about that, there are three amazing books that I recommend that you read. There's one called Bad Pharma, which is written by an English doc named uh, Ben Goldacre, who's a great author, really love his stuff. The ex-editor-in-chief uh, of the New England Journal of Medicine, Marsha Angel, MD, in the United States, wrote a book called The Truth About Drug Companies. It's well worth what, uh, a read. And then Gary Null, PhD, wrote a book uh, in, I think it's about 2010-11, called Death by Medicine, which is a con controversial title. Again, it's well worth reading to find out why natural therapies are withheld from the, the general public and why there's no a, a much smaller amount of science to back them up. I always say, when science is lacking, fall back on common sense and clinical experience. If you can find a doctor, like I did, who had success dealing with these issues, find out what they do and learn from them. And so I paid a lot of money to learn what to do uh, from a natural perspective with all these different bad bugs. Now, just to mention again the H. pylori home recovery plan, because I know a lot of people said they won't be able to uh, uh, to stay for the whole uh, program, the whole seminar. Um, the brand new uh, uh, delivered live H. pylori home recovery plan is going to take people through a 12-week step-by-step process to implement all the information I'm basically talking about um, on this webinar and a lot more. Uh, the registration link is uh, there on the slide, or you can uh, just look directly under the uh, the link to your action guide beneath this window, and you'll you'll be able to click through to the more detailed info on that program. There's only 40 places for this inaugural program. We will open it up again in the future, uh, but um, you know for now we can only take 40 on because because of our lack of resources in being able to help everybody individually. So let's have a look at some foods that fight H. pylori now. Um, we get a lot of questions about this, and there are some articles at my website and a lot, a lot of information in my book and what have you on this. What I would always say is that, yes, we know that there are foods out there that can fight against H. pylori. Broccoli sprouts, olive oil, garlic, green tea, cranberries and cranberry juice, cabbage juice, berry extracts, manuka honey, possibly things like coconut oil. They're all listed in your action guide again. I don't think there's any harm in eating these. The problem is, if you're looking at fulfilling a goal of getting rid of H. pylori, how much of these foods do you need to eat? How often do you need to eat them? For how long? Nobody's done the study. So you're going to find people who get success using these methods, but they're definitely not going to work for everybody. Again, no harm introducing these foods more regularly into your diet, but be aware that they might not necessarily work for you to absolutely knock out the H. pylori. The other question that we always have to ask when we're looking at studies, and I'm very critical of studies that are done on things like natural uh, 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 therapies, if you like, as well as the, the medical studies that are done. Was the study done in a lab, in a test tube or a dish, or was it actually done in the body? Because there may be a, a very, very large difference between the effect of a specific herb or food in a lab dish compared to in the human stomach or intestine. You know, the substances are going to be um, uh, uh, exposed to a completely different environment when they're in the gut 
rather than in a lab. So we have to take that into account as well and be sensible with not, you know, going overboard in trying to say, um, you know, make silly claims that a certain food is a, is a wonder cure for everything. What are some other H. pylori fighting compounds that you tend to be able to get in supplement form? Well, mastic gum. I personally like a product called Gastromend HP uh, by a company called Designs for Health. Um, I'm not a salesman for them or anything like that. However, I found it very effective because it contains other substances that we're about to talk about as well. Very potent garlic extract in a product called Alicillin by the same company. There's bismuth citrate, which is used medically in quadruple therapy. It's also available in uh, commercially available supplements uh, in products called BioHPF uh, or Pyloracil. Again, this is in your action guide if you want further information. There is deglycerizinated licorice root extract, which is a tongue twister at the best of times. That's also in the Gastromend HP product. Um, derived from cabbage juice, we also have vitamin U. It's not really a vitamin, but it's just nicknamed vitamin U. It's also called MSM. And again, that's derived, uh, or it's in, should I say, Gastromend HP. And then you have zinc L-carnosine, which seems to have some anti-H pylori activity, but it's also very good for healing the stomach lining. You know, we talk about needing to patch up the gut after we've removed the bad guys, and that's in Gastromend HP and Pyloracil. Berberine is in BioHPF, and then there's also Silver. Uh, there's a, a product called Silvercillin. Just a note on that one, I've never used that with clients. I don't know how effective it is with H. pylori, so I'm not going to make any claims. I don't have any experience of it, but some people have... Uh, you know, if you go on YouTube and you look on, on online, some people seem to have had success using uh, silver supplements because they're highly antibacterial. There's another product out there that is of great interest to me called Siberian Pine Nut Oil. And again, a lot of people um, uh, tell me that it, it's worked really well for them um, in not only eradicating H. pylori, but also caused, uh, calming stomach pain. I've never used this product personally. Um, or uh, with any clients in, in, in the programs that I give them. Uh, I can't really comment on it. And the reason I haven't used it is not because I'm scared to use it, but it's just that I have a, a formula that seems to work very well for people. And I don't think people would appreciate it if they came along to me and said, Dave, I need your advice. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't we just try this? I've never used it before, but let's use you as a guinea pig and see if it works. So by all means, try that product off your own back Siberian pine nut oil, but I, 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 you know, I've read some good things about it, but I've never had any experience myself of, of, of seeing it work. So again, I can't, I can't really comment. Um, there's one other product that I forgot to put a slide in. The product that worked for me is Matula Herbal Formula. I've written a, a little page of notes in the action guide about Matula Herbal Formula. I used it twice to get rid of H. pylori. It worked. It might not necessarily work for everybody. On face value, it appears to be expensive. And I think that's why it gets such a bad rap. Online, you look on the internet forums and the odd person says, well, it didn't work for me. It's a rip-off. It's a fraud. It's a, you know, they're, they're just charlatans and what have you. But it isn't. It isn't a scam. It works. It's just that it can't possibly work for every single person. It's like everything else. Nothing that we're talking about will work for every single person. We have to be in integrity here and admit some things work really well for some people and not for others. I've found that with a combination of nutrition and diet changes, lifestyle changes, supporting a person's immune system, getting the inflammation in their gut under control, then using Matula Herbal Formula, it works well in excess of 90% of the time well in excess. So I'm biased towards it because it worked for me. It doesn't mean I'm right or wrong. I'm biased because I had a great result using that product. So I've, if other people can get that result, I'm going to recommend it. And I'm not going to sit there and you know be called a fraud or a cheat or a charlatan for recommending it. It works for a lot of people. Okay. But just as the drugs don't work for everybody, neither does the Matula Herbal Formula. As we go on, we'll talk about food in a bit more detail. You know, some people just carry on eating absolute junk in their diet. And because they've spent a couple of hundred bucks on this sort of magical tea, Matula Herbal Formula, they think they have a divine right to get better because they've spent the money on the tea. 
but they carry on shoveling McDonald's and, and garbage food into their into their systems and wonder why they don't feel better. It's not the it's not the fault of the tea. It's the fact that they're not doing the right things um, in other areas of their lives. In my opinion and in my observation as well. So just be aware of that. So what are the advantages of a natural approach? Well, it's gentle and it has less side effects in general. It's highly effective in many cases. The products are widely available. You don't require a prescription. Some of the products also have antifungal and antiparasitic parasitic activities as well, such as the garlic extract and the berberine and, and what have you. Substances help to reduce inflammation and heal the stomach lining in addition to having anti-H pylori activity. And they don't tend to induce the antibacterial resistance issues that we have. What are the disadvantages of a natural approach? Because there are some, let's, let's face it, this isn't all about, you know, bash the antibiotics and use a natural approach. There are disadvantages for people with a natural approach as well, which are it may not work as quickly as antibiotics. Um, generally, the programs have to be taken in a well-structured manner and for long enough to be effective. Different brands of the same uh, substance might not be created equal. You could have two different uh, manufacturers making, say, mastic gum, and the products might not be as potent as one another. So one person does great and the other person doesn't. Anything and everything that you put in your body, on your skin, or that you breathe in has the potential to cause a reaction. Some people die when they eat a shrimp. Some people die when they eat a peanut. You know, the anaphylactic shock issue. We all have a different immune setup within our bodies. Therefore, literally anything that you use in or on your body can create a reaction. So, you know, all the natural substances have the potential to create some side effects in some people. And, of course, the natural protocols tend to be an out-of-pocket expense. They're not available on healthcare systems. And it's how you use these products that counts, in my opinion. Which company do you use? What dose do you use? How long do you use it? Do you take it with or without food, etc., etc.? And the action guide gives you some help with all that. A couple of very quick successful protocols. As I've mentioned, 30 to 60 days of Matula Herbal Formula. That worked really, really well for me. In my experience, it's worked for virtually all my clients over the last half decade, with a couple of exceptions, but not many. Um, 60 days on Gastromend HP allicillin and either maybe bio hpf or pyloracil that has also worked very well for me as well i was working with quite a few people in australia at a time when matula herbal formula wasn't allowed into the country because of their customs regulations and i was using the gastromend allicillin um, protocol and getting nearly 100% um, success with that as well in people so it's kind of take your choice you know you do have options here and that's the goal of this presentation to give you the options are these protocols effective? Yep, just to hammer home, myself and thousands of others are walking proof that they do work. In more than half a decade of working with H. pylori sufferers, I've rarely had cases where herbal protocols did not work. And I have the before and after lab tests in many cases to prove it. And a whole bunch of testimonials that are on the, you know, on the website as well. Can you combine the medical and the natural treatments? Well, I think you can. Um, Studies show that several herbs as well as probiotics can enhance the efficacy of pharmaceutical treatment and or reduce the side effects. What I tend to do, because we don't necessarily know the interactions between the drugs and the herbs, I would usually say to people, if you're going to use both, do it back to back rather than at the same time. Take your drugs first and then do the herbs or take the herbs first, then do the drugs. Don't do them together because nobody's really studied whether there can be a dangerous interaction between those substances. Now studies show that probiotic uh, supplementation may enhance triple therapy success rate. Um, I explain this in my book and we'll cover it in a lot more detail in the home recovery plan. Probiotics seem to enhance the success of the antibiotics in killing the H. pylori as well as reducing side effects. Probiotics serve many other important functions Things like uh, supporting your immune system, helping you digest food. So the probiotics help you make some uh, B vitamins and, and, and synthesize other nutrients. Um, they help to crowd out yeast and fungal organisms that might overgrow otherwise and a whole bunch of other uh, valuable uh, properties as well. When we do our comprehensive stool testing with clients, we actually measure the good bacteria levels and it's very common to see low levels of good bacteria. 
and that's what allows a lot of the bad bugs to get in in the first place. It's again how you consume the probiotics, which product do you take, when do you take it, is it in the morning, is it at night, with or without food, etc. Very important to understand that and again the info uh, is in the book and, and also um, in, in our consultancy and what have you as well. Quick summary about the botanical options. Botanical just means herbal. They do work as long as they're used properly. Get the right product in the right dose for the right duration. They have advantages and disadvantages just like antibiotics, which you're now aware of. You can use them before or after medical treatment. My recommendation would not be to use them at the same time. Probiotics can enhance antibiotic efficacy and reduce side effects of the antibiotics at the same time. Okay, the final main topic that I want to cover because it's one that comes in, you know, the questions come in in various guises uh, all the time, literally every day. My test results show me H. pylori has been eradicated, but I still have all my symptoms. Why is this? Well, this situation arises as the result of po several possible factors. Um, one, H. pylori hasn't actually been eradicated and the retest that you've had done is actually wrong. That can happen. None of the H. pylori tests, as I will explain in a separate event, separate teleclinic, none of the H. pylori tests are 100% accurate. Zero. Not one. They can all give false negatives and some of them can give false positives as well, particularly the blood test. Too much bad food is going into your system. You have other bad bugs in your system or you're full of bad toxins. They can all create symptoms even when the H. pylori has gone. A lack of good food, a lack of good bugs and a lack of good nutrients can also create symptoms. So when you have too much bad stuff in your body and you don't have enough good stuff, you're not going to feel well. It makes sense. It's just common sense. And people are putting lots of bad foods into the body that they may not even realize are bad foods. They may have another bad bug or even multiple bad bugs. As I showed you on my own lab test, I had an aspergillus overgrowth and blastocystis hominis as well. And they caused my symptoms or certain symptoms to, to carry on even when the H. pylori had gone. Many of these bad bugs make the toxins themselves as well. They're called endo toxins and they can create a lot of problems in the gut also. If you don't have enough of the good bacteria, if you're deficient in nutrients like uh, magnesium and B12 and things like that, you're just not going to feel well. It's that simple. Okay, so the focus of my work is not just to help people overcome H. pylori. I've kind of gotten this um, um, uh, label, if you like, of the H. pylori guy. Dave knows everything about H. pylori, but that's really only a fraction of what I'm able to do to help people and, 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 the, and the practitioners uh, that I also train up to, uh, to implement these methods as well. We want to help people optimize health so that they remain healthy for a long time. We don't just want to necessarily say, all right, take this magic potion for a few days and, or a couple of weeks and, you know, hey, presto, the H. pylori is going to go away. It's about getting healthy, which is not necessarily the same thing. And that, you know, they are two completely different goals and outcomes. Eliminate H. pylori or eliminate your symptoms. They're not always transferable. Sometimes they are. Some people get rid of H. pylori and they feel amazing. Okay, they're the guys, they're the people who don't need us. Okay, um, they just don't need our help. They can use the antibiotics and boom, it's gone. No problem. Just a quick one, a splinter analogy. If you have a splinter or a nail stuck in your finger, a piece of glass, for example, just because you take it out doesn't mean that the pain and the wound goes away. So it's the same with H. pylori. If H. pylori is screwed into your digestive lining as it does with its corkscrew shape, boom, getting rid of it doesn't necessarily heal the damage that it's been done. So the symptoms can carry on because of that. How do you resolve that? Well, you can take steps to heal the gut lining a little bit faster. The stomach lining can be severely damaged by H. pylori and other factors. Antibiotics can kill the H. pylori, but do nothing to repair the stomach. In the H. pylori home recovery plan, I teach people how to use glutamine, uh, gelatin, or bone broth, which is very easy to do, uh, which can give the nutrients that help to patch up the gut lining. Nutrients like zinc, vitamin C, can also be very effective, as can things like deglycerizinated uh, licorice or DGL. Okay, what are some of the bad foods that people are eating? Well, 
a lot of the common foods can cause the same irritation to the stomach and intestine as H. pylori. And this is, if I'm honest, a way, way bigger problem than H. pylori itself. Changing diet is the single best way to work towards optimizing digestive health and health in general. No question about that in my um, sort of 10 years in this industry, five or, five or six of them as a functional medicine practitioner. Changing diet is the number one therapy. It works best for the most number of people. What are the bad foods? Gluten is a terrible food uh, or constituent part of many grains like wheat, barley, and uh, spelt and things like that. Uh, rye also. It's a nightmare for many people. Can't go into it in detail, but we'll do a separate webinar on it. Soy. Health food. It isn't a health food for most people. I'm allergic to it. it causes digestive problems with me. If I had H. pylori and I hadn't gotten rid of the soy in my diet, even getting rid of the H. pylori wouldn't have helped me feel better because soy causes a lot of the same symptoms. Cow's milk can be a nightmare for some people. Many of the vegetable oils, except olive oil and coconut oil, can be hugely problematic for people, as can the very processed forms of vegetable oils like margarine. Many processed foods and the E numbers and additives can cause irritation to the gut as well. And even certain vegetables, if they're undercooked, can cause many digestive problems. They're the foods that I would immediately recommend people avoid for at least 30 days to see how they feel. Bad bugs. Statistically, according to the results of our lab tests, um, again, as I say, well over a thousand clients now um, over the past half decade or so, just over 50% had other bad bugs in their system. Parasites, uh, different kinds of bacteria other than H. pylori, some names that you may have uh, heard of, E. coli, Campylobacter, uh, Salmonella, Vibrio, we've seen all of them. And then there's things like fungal overgrowth, Candida overgrowth as it's commonly known. I've personally seen 30 or more different chronic digestive infections in clients over the last half decade. Uh, and sometimes you just have to eliminate them all before people feel better. Uh, parasites like Giardia, Blastocystis, Cryptosporidium are very common. I've seen worms, things like hookworm, whipworm. There's another one called Strongyloides, which can be a bit of a nightmare for people as well. It can cause all the same symptoms as H. pylori, incidentally. And there'll be more about this in the H. pylori testing teleclinic. Just a couple of images there of some of the bad bugs. The one on the left that looks like something from outer space is a hookworm, magnified many times. The one in the middle are uh, cryptosporidium organisms um, in someone's intestine. And the one on the right-hand side is a little bug called uh, Giardia, which many of you will have heard of. It causes something called beaver fever in North America. Um, candida and fungi. Well, candida, you, many of you will have heard of. It proliferates during triple therapy and even when people just use acid-blocking medications. This has been shown in studies. Literally a couple of days after people have started using the um, acid-inhibiting drugs, these fungal organisms can overgrow. And they do so because the acid is not, not there to kill them anymore. So you can get what we call a rebound overgrowth of yeast, fungi, candida, whatever you want to call it, because of taking these medications. Sometimes we have to run a, a strong candida cleanse with people um, and they'll only feel better once they've done that. These overgrowths with the yeast and fungal organisms can cause the same symptoms as H. pylori. Can symptoms worsen after treatment? Well, they can. I've seen cases and spoken to quite a few people where their symptoms worsened after treatment. And now you have an understanding of why this can happen. It's often due to bad foods that people are eating, um, allergies and reactions that are triggered by uh, taking antibiotics and things like that, um, or by uh, having bad bugs in the system, uh, or because more healing time is required, etc. So if you just break it down into something very simple, fungal overgrowth, food reactions, parasites. They can all worsen after H. pylori is eradicated, and they can all cause the same or similar symptoms to H. pylori. Now, there is a parasite stroke fungal questionnaire in the action guide. Have a look at it. Um, fill in the questionnaire in your own time. See if you score high. Do remember that the same symptoms that can be caused by uh, parasites can also be caused by foods that you're eating. And it's a lot easier to change your diet than it is to spend a bunch of money trying to figure out you know, what parasites you have and, and, and dealing with them. So that's why I always recommend dietary manipulation to my clients first. So a summary. You can see why just taking antibiotics or even a herbal protocol may not work for everybody. 
they will work for some people and uh, people will feel amazing. They don't need to do anything fancy. Seven or 10 days, 14 days on antibiotics, all their problems go away. But with other people, that doesn't happen. And what I hope I've done here is I've, I hope I've taught you why so that you're not confused anymore and you have a path now, you have some understanding of why you're still not feeling well after you've taken H. pylori treatment. So what can we do about all this? Well, it's up to you how you decide to treat H. pylori. It's totally your decision. Nobody's going to try and boss you around and tell you how to do that. I've given you the pros and cons of each method and some of the reasons you might still feel unwell even though the H. pylori has gone. So it's what you want. Do you just want to eradicate H. pylori or do you also want to learn how to prevent the reinfection, deal with the bad foods, deal with the other bad bugs and the toxins and things and optimise your health rather than just dealing with the infection, your decision. If you just want to eradicate the H. pylori and leave it at that, get the antibiotics, they have a 70% chance of working, they might cause some side effects but they can still work even though they cause the side effects, but do make sure you get retested 30 to 60 days after treatment to make sure that the H. pylori has gone. And if the symptoms remain, you know where we are. Now, if you just want to eradicate H. pylori, but you don't want to take antibiotics, try some Matula herbal formula. Try the pine nut oil. Try the other products listed on your action guide, but the same rules apply. You still might experience side effects. Make sure you get retested okay, to make sure that the H. pylori has gone. Now, if you want a more thorough approach, you might want to consider getting my book if you haven't already read it. There's quite a lot of information about dietary changes and things like that in there. It's obviously, it's called the H. pylori diet, so that's what you'd expect. It's available at Amazon um, as a paperback or Kindle. It's also available at uh, my website as a uh, full PDF or as the paper book as, uh, excuse me, paperback as well. Now, I just want to tell you, um, if you don't mind, I hope... Um, uh, you guys don't mind me teaching you a little bit here about the H. pylori home recovery plan. The very first program um, is going to be starting very soon, actually, at the end of May 2013. And um, it's been, as I said uh, right at the start, uh, two years in the making to try and just get it right so that we put the right information in it. And basically, it's for people who want to learn to get really healthy as well as getting rid of H. pylori. I'm going to be sharing a lot more nuggets than I did tonight in that program because I just don't have time to share them uh, in the space or time that we've had. If you don't like reading books, it's going to be a great program for you as well because it's a step-by-step do-it-yourself guide. Now, um, it's also great if you want some more in-depth help but you don't necessarily have financial resources to go and see a naturopath or a private doctor every week and you know spend a fortune on, on the consultancy. Um, how do I know it's going to help you? Well, it's the time-tested and proven program that I fine-tuned myself over more than half a decade uh, to help you know well over a thousand clients achieve success in their own health-related goals. Um, it's not something that I'm going to be blindly testing on people. This stuff works. Uh, we know it works because we've seen it work time and time again. What is it? Well, it's a simple 12-week program that takes you through a step-by-step -step process to optimize your digestive health. It's the exact same program I tend to work through with my one-to-one -one coaching clients, uh, but at a fraction of the investment. What results can you expect? Well, I can't promise miracles because I don't know you, I don't know who you are, I don't know what you're struggling with at the moment, but people who follow the advice in the program will nearly always overcome their digestive symptoms, improve their energy levels, improve their mood, sleep better if that's a problem for you, experience less pain, whether that's in the gut or whether it may even be in the joints or headaches and things like that, uh, and will tend, to help, will tend to help eliminate all the unwanted bad bugs from this system as well. How's it delivered? Well, the H. pylori home recovery plan is going to be delivered in the same fashion or similar to this particular teleclinic. There's one lesson each week with a set of action steps for you to implement over the course of that week. And then each new action step builds upon the last one. In terms of the program resources, um, for people to uh, consume the information in a format that suits their needs or for you to consume the info in, in a format that suits your needs, you'll receive a video presentation of each lesson like this one, a downloadable PDF of the lesson for you to make notes on, um, an action guide just like the action guide for this particular 
um, teleclinic and also the mp3 recording of each lesson so that you can just take the audio if you want to listen to it in your car on your iPod or, or iPhone or whatever um, uh, gizmo you have that, that you like to use. Now the beauty of the program is that it's all recorded and you get lifetime ac access to the entire program. When I say lifetime I mean it's lifetime, it's not going to go away, you're going to be able to log into the website get all the updates as we put them in, there'll be a bunch of special bonuses and things like that as well that you're going to be able to access. It means you can dip into the program at any time you want. If you're unable to un attend the live sessions, you can access and follow the program at your own pace. What you're going to learn. Okay, here's just a snippet. Uh, commonly eaten foods, the ones that damage your gut, how to avoid them and why. I'm going to teach you exactly why they damage the gut and why I feel they need to be avoided. I'm going to teach you delicious alternatives to replace the ones you avoid. You're going to get a whole bunch of shopping guides and menu planners, a wide selection of recipe ideas to help you implement the recommendations for both meals and snacks. I'm going to teach you precisely how to use um, uh, the protocols we've talked about today to help you with your H. pylori. Even if you don't have H. pylori, by the way, this program is still going to benefit you because it's teaching you so many other sound principles. Uh, we're going to talk about how to minimize the risk of yeast and fungal overgrowth during and after the um, anti-H. pylori program, whether you're following a doctor's advice or the herbal route. I'm going to talk about how to use nutrition to heal your stomach and your intestine, uh, intestinal lining faster. Uh, we're going to talk about how you uh, optimize your digestion so that you absorb nutrients properly from the brand new eating plan, how to restore the good bacteria levels using, using either food or supplements. I'm going to talk about how to identify specific food allergies that might might interfere with your recovery. We're going to talk uh, about how to tell if you have other bad bugs in your digestive system that might also prevent your recovery. We're also going to learn how you can use food to optimize energy production in your body, which then causes improvements in pretty much everything. We'll talk about how to use food uh, to get a perfect night's sleep. Um, even for those of you who think you sleep well, I think we can improve sleep in most people uh, by using food, believe it or not. Um, and you'll find that you'd wake feeling more fully refreshed because you've had a better night's sleep. And you can do that using food. And just to give you a hint, it's using food to balance your blood sugar and stop your blood sugar dropping down too low at night. And we're going to talk about how this improved energy production is going to build a bulletproof immune system for you that keeps you healthy moving forward and hopefully protects you against reinfection. More benefits, well you're also going to get private email access to both myself and Jack Walton who's my senior consultant. So you can ask your own personal questions um, about the program and, and have them answered by us via email. Uh, that's something that we only usually do for our private coaching clients but we're going to implement that into the program because we want the program to be to be get better each time we teach it. You guys will be the first on the program because it's the first one. We want to improve it and we want to encourage as much two-way communication as we can. Um, there are going to be some bonuses with the program. All my ebooks, which are the uh, What Your Doctor Didn't Tell You About Parasites ebook, the H. pylori diet ebook, the online version of the H. pylori secrets DVD, which is four or five hours worth of me again presenting on various topics. Um, the DVD I mentioned right at the start. We've got a uh, recipe and cookbook with lots of gluten-free recipes and uh, dairy-free recipes and things for you to use to make implementing the strategies nice and easy. And I'm going to throw in a 25% discount on all our future products and uh, publications as they are released uh, because you'll be part of the, uh, the inner circle, so to speak. Um, finally, we're going to use uh, we're going to do something um, that we've done just once before and um, it was great fun. I'm going to have a prize draw for the first 20 people um, who register for the inaugural, excuse me, inaugural H. pylori home recovery plan. Um, and the lucky winner is going to receive um, a stool test, comprehensive stool test, and a personalised consultation, which is actually valued at three hundred and eighty dollars. Um, what's the investment for the recovery plan? Well, complete with all the bonuses. Um, that I've just talked about, um, the investment is just 197 um, for the full 12 weeks. Um, it's going to be well over 12 hours contact time plus email support with Jack and I, which is actually going to be work out for, uh, at actually less than a single 60-minute consultation would be 
our usual hourly rate. So when you work it out, you know it's 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 less than um, it's less than twenty bucks a, a session, really, which we think is hopefully going to be uh, great value. So essentially, you know, based on those figures, um, if you had twelve hours of consultancy time with us, you'd be uh, you know be saving yourself a good couple of thousand uh, dollars. And we do have people pay those consultancy fees over a period of time. There are only 40 spaces available because of the limitation of um, a jack and I's time in terms of being able to e email uh, backwards and forwards and make sure we provide adequate support. Uh, once the program's full, it's going to be full, and the next live program is not going to be for another three or four months. So uh, if you'd like to register, there is a link uh, beneath the action guide link. You know, So if you look beneath this webinar window, um, you'll see a, a link that you can just click through on and you can go and read more about it. Uh, see if it's for you, um, and uh, and sign up if you you know if you want to. Um, the link is also here on this slide. It's uh, hpylorisymptoms.com forward slash teleclinic. Uh, and as I say, I'm just going to share as much information as I possibly can with you about what I've learned over the last sort of five or six years how to deal with digestive problems over and above H. pylori, uh, which can for some people just be a you know a very small part of the situation. Okay, um, really all that remains is for me just to say an, an absolutely enormous thank you for listening or watching this presentation. You know, I really appreciate the time, as I said before, uh, that you've taken out to, to glean the information. Go through the information again. You can watch this time and time again. You can look at the action guide um, if you need anything uh, to stick more firmly in, you know, in that uh, grey matter uh, of yours. Um, and literally just... Try not to delay. Make your decision on how you'd like to deal with your H. pylori or whatever issues are, you, you know, are troubling you at the moment based on the information that I've provided. Remember, there's no right or wrong way, just the way you choose. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us at, at uh, office at hpexperts.com. The HP stands for H. pylori, of course, and we'll be more than happy to help. We normally try and get back to people within 24 hours, if not sooner. Um, so from me, thanks very much again for listening. I really appreciate you and um, I'll talk to you again very soon.